So good evening and good morning to some. Let's begin a study circle on looking from within. And before we start, if we can just take one or two minutes just to ingather a consciousness. Just a fancy way of saying, just let's be fully present here for what we are doing. We are always distracted. We might not be able to admit it, but we are. So with the help of this chant, with the help of our breath, taking a few breaths, being fully present to them, taking them all the way in, all the way out. We'll do that for the next few minutes. Thank you. When walking grace, aspiring that we can see a bit more than we usually see, expand more than we already are, to be you know, what we are possible, what is our possibility. Through the words of, through the teachings, through the grace of various masters and mystics, so uh, as I had, as I'm sure we know that right now we are exploring the words of Mother and Sri Aurobindo uh, through a compilation which is titled "Looking from Within." So it is a compilation done by Mukta A S Dalal. And this is a beginner's guide. So that's the reason we decided to start it. And it hasn't been long that we have excuse me, started it. So welcome to Deepa and Vasu. And just to give you a bit overview bit of it. So we just did the introduction, which you can read in your own time. And if there's anything, we can have a short 10, 15 minutes, you know, or 30 minutes connect of us but just to give you an idea it was an introduction and then we went to section one the title is looking at life and circumstances and till now we have just done the power of attitude so as uh, what i remember and uh, this okay yeah and what i remember and ritu you can please correct me if i'm wrong but even the introduction was mostly about just attitude so it's just that, you know, there's nothing in life as such. You know, when things happen to us, it doesn't mean a good thing or a bad thing. Everything depends on the attitude that I take. Uh, I think we'll just read this for once again. It will be good for us to also read it. So if anybody is willing, they can please read this for us a bit slowly so that we can understand. This is before the book starts, a uh, text, you know, basically a quote from Sri Aurobindo. Yeah, I can read it. So it says that the inner spiritual progress does not depend on outer conditions so much as in the way we react to them from within, that has always been the ultimate verdict of spiritual experience. You know, it's like we keep blaming, we keep thinking that these are my circumstances, this happened to me, that happened to me. But here it's being said that it's not the circumstance, but the way we react to it. 
it is why we insist on taking the right attitude and persisting in it. On an inner state not dependent on outer circumstances, a state of equality and calm, if it cannot be at once of inner happiness, ongoing more and more within and looking from within outwards, instead of living in the surface mind, which is always at the mercy of the shocks and blows of life. So here it's being said that we basically always look, take life from outside, right? Our eyes are always facing outside. We are always just looking outside as to what is happening to me, what is the other doing, how do I react and all. But here they are saying there's a shift because we truly know and we'll uh, read more about it that honestly it's the inner attitude that one takes on which a lot is determined. So one has to start now, stop looking always outside. One can learn to look from within. Because if we stay on the surface, if we just take ourselves as this body and just believe that, okay, I have a mind, I have feelings, I will always be at the mercy of the shocks and blows of life. And we all know that we have had a share of shocks and blows. So it is only from the inner state that one can be stronger than life and its disturbing force and hope to conquer. You know, if we have ever observed or studied the life of any master or mystic, you know, we the stillness of the being really attracts us, right? Like nothing can really move them. So much happens and there are so many stories that it's like, you know, this happened and the answer is so what? That happened and the answer is doesn't matter. And yet something even small happens to me. My life goes haywire. So that stillness and that groundedness, we too can invite and invoke in our life. But it takes practice. Firstly, we, we need an you know aspiration that I want it. It doesn't just come. Or, I mean, it might come for a few people naturally because we don't know, you know, what the past lives were, how their life has been. But for most of us, we have to work on it, practice it, invite it in our lives and work to make it into a habit for us. Yeah, anything? So this is an interactive discussion. Any questions that you have, I mean, feel free to just share any time. And uh, yeah, so this was just an introduction. Anything that seems heavy, just know this is just the beginning and we we'll like explore more. So I'll request you to uh, read the introduction yourself. And you know, in this, uh, one thing was very interesting, although it's quite known but I'll just go through it for you guys that there was there are three parts of the being it is said it is the physical being as we know so basically it's said I'm sorry there is an outer being an inner being and an innermost being so broadly speaking there are two divisions in the human being the outer being which constitutes the personality which comes from the word mask you know how we say my personality, his personality. So it comes from the word, the mask that we are wearing. So that's the outer being. And then there is the inner being, which is the true being. Or the person who uses the outer mask of the personality. So if when you go through it, anything that you would want to discuss, we'll discuss. And then in the outer being, there are three parts. The physical, which would be the body. The vital, so you know, the vitality, the energy, the feelings that comes under the vital and then the mental. We all know, right? Body, feelings, mind. It's quite common. But if I'm going fast, just stop me. Yeah, so that was just the introduction. This is chapter one, looking at life and circumstances 
And basically, again, you know what we just read, that events, circumstances, they in itself, in themselves, hold no value. It's what happens, how we react to them. That's what makes something good or bad. So all depends on the personal attitude, everything. So there is a moment when one becomes sufficiently conscious to realize that things in themselves are truly neither good nor bad. They are this only in relation to us. Their effect on us depends absolutely upon the attitude we have towards them. So this was just a nutshell about the attitudes. Yeah. So again, this is a repetition if you read here. There is no iron or ineffugable law that, like that cannot be changed. That a given contact shall create pain or pleasure. It is the way the soul meets the rush or pressure of the man upon the members from outside them that determines either reaction. So, I don't know if this was an okay introduction. If you have any questions, you ask me. Otherwise, like I said, if you go through it, we three can have a short session to just go through the thing that we have covered. It's not much and yet it is something. We did quite a few sessions on it. So that was the attitude. And today, although we have done it, we'll just redo it. We had taken a bit of it. The determining power is within. So again, it's kind of tying up with the attitude, right? That the determining power is within. Yeah. So we can take it up and at any point, if there's any question, any concern, any reflection, feel free to unmute and share. Yeah. So uh, Jagan, we have not done anything new yet. It's just, we are just having a recap. Yeah. Everything okay? Okay. Okay, so... Anybody who is willing can, uh, they can unmute please and read this for us. The re determining power is within. And otherwise, I'll. I can read it now. Please do. Uh, the, the, determin the determining power is within. You should not be so dependent on outward things. It is this attitude that makes you give so excessive an importance to circumstances. I do not say that circumstances cannot help or hinder, but they are circumstances, not the fundamental thing which is in ourselves. And their help or their hindrance ought not to be of primary importance. In yoga, as in every great or serious human effort, there is always bound to be an abundance of adverse interventions and unfavorable circumstances which have to be overcome. To give them too great an importance, to give them too great an importance, increases their importance and their power to multiply themselves, gives them, as it were, confidence in themselves and the habit of coming. To face them with equanimity, if one cannot manage a cheerful persistence against them of confident and resolute will, diminishes. I'll just read that one more time. To face them with equanimity, if one cannot manage a cheerful persistence against them of confident and resolute will, diminishes. On the contrary, their importance and effect, and in the end, though not at once, 
get rid of their persistence and recurrence. It is therefore a principle in yoga to recognize the determining power of what is within us, for that is the deeper truth, to set that right and establish the inward strength as against the power of outward circumstances. The strength is there, even in the weakest. One has to find it, to unveil it and to keep it in front throughout the journey and the battle. Sri Aurobindo. Thank you, Jagan. So, I thought we had not read it, but we have read this last time, but we just read it. Uh, we'll go through it line by line so that we can understand it. You know, it says here that you should not be so dependent on outward things. It feels strange when we read it, especially in the beginning, because for me, outward is all there is, right? He said this to me, she did this, my childhood trauma, my adventures of the youth, everything is outside of me. But here we are being told that you should not be so dependent on outward things. It is this attitude that makes you give so excessive an importance to circumstances. So why do we give so much importance to circumstances? Because we believe that that is it. They make or break us. But we know that, you know, there are so many times we have so many stories that we have heard and read that when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? That it's like when it's really at the breaking point a lot of time, it's then that people shine. There was this quote I read once, you know, just by somebody anonymous. He had said that whenever, you know, it was about women. And it was like another woman saying it to a woman that whenever I see like, you know, a very courageous and outshining woman, I wonder what challenges, what mountains she must have climbed to be where she is right now because she's amazing. So we know this somehow. We might not believe it fully, but pain, challenges, difficulties, you know, they shape us, they help us grow. So I think on the same regard, it is being said here that, that we are more than our circumstances and the more we believe in it, the less importance we'll give to our circumstances. So she goes further, he goes sorry further and says, I do not say that circumstances cannot help or hinder but they are circumstances, not the fundamental things, which is in ourselves. So it's an outer stimulus, but what's in within me is the main thing. And their help or their hindrance ought not to be of primary importance. So it's not about what happened to me. It's about how I faced it, what I did. You know, it's like when life gives me lemonade, make, you know, sorry, lemons make lemonade kind of a thing. It's a kiddie statement and yet it is true. I would like to pause here and I, oh, sorry, I don't know why I'm making it down today. And I would just want us to, and I, I just want to touch base that are we following what's going on, especially like Vasu and Deepa, is it okay? Am I going too fast or? That's good. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Sham. Good to see you. Okay. So it further says that in yoga, as in every great or serious human effort, there is always bound to be an abundance of adverse interventions and unfavorable circumstances which have to be overcome.
तो इन ऑर्डनरी लाइफ और इन लाइफ ऑफ से अ साधक राइट अ साधक इज समबडी हु इज ट्राइंग टू साधो देम सेल्फ राइट व्हाट ट्राइंग टू बिकम मोर देन व्हाट दे आर बिकॉज़ दे बिलीव दैट देयर इज मोर टू लाइफ देन जस्ट दिस ईटिंग ड्रिंकिंग रिलेशनशिप्स एंड यू नो सो मेनी अदर थिंग्स सो द वन हु वांट्स टू नो हु वांट्स टू कनेक्ट विद इन that person as well as in general we know that there is an abundance of adverse interventions and circumstances which we all overcome so to give them too great an importance increases their importance and their power to multiply themselves sorry and their power to multiply themselves give them as it were confidence in themselves and the habit of coming So the more importance I give to adverse and unfavorable circumstances, the more they visit me. So it's very interesting to read that, right? Like the more attention I give to illness, the more illness will be, come to me. The more I react, the more I say, "Oh God, bichari, mein mere swati kyu hota hai?" So it comes again and again and again till you say that, "Oh, I've got it." i don't think i need to be scared of it anymore but and because you know the universe it's so kind that it wants us to be like really strong and really be able to transcend the small things in our life good morning joshna ji welcome yeah so it keeps giving us you know the universe keeps giving us wake up calls so that we would wake up but if things don't go that well we keep sleeping we keep sleeping so so that we don't keep sleeping we get nightmares either we can cry that oh god i got a nightmare why 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 or we can say oh it was a nightmare but it woke me up so let me do something constructive now so just that i so to give them which is unfavorable circumstances too great an importance increases their importance and their power to multiply themselves gives them as it were confidence in themselves and the habit of coming so the more we want to avoid certain things certain type of people certain relationships we will see that the more i find myself in that given situation because i have to develop strength to face them i have to transcend them so that's how life is working you know we feel that the aim of life is comfort is happiness is just you know let everything be hunky dory but we have come here for a purpose we have come here to be more to evolve ourselves to transcend our current selves and for that these are like you know stumbling blocks these are like resistances we get so that we become stronger and stronger so for these to face them with equanimity you know something happens you fall sick and either you can start crying that oh i'm sick again i'm sick again or you can say i've been sick so many times and i have by grace recovered right this time too i'll see how fast i recover and we have we have such people in our lives right that nothing seems to shake them and we also have people that every small thing they hold their heads and start crying or blaming everybody and we all get drawn towards people who say that oh so what let it come i'll face it so here it's saying that if we face things with equanimity either you know the ideal thing is a cheerful persistent the jo ho raha hai aap khush ho you know like they say that meera ne wish ka pyala itni khushi se piya right like she said yes yes like anything else he was delighted but if right now i cannot be cheerful when life is giving me a tight slap it's saying that at least face it with equanimity that ha huh, you know i i got a slap and you know just two months back i got such a reward too 
and again i'll get something something will be taken from me that is how life works you know there's this beautiful example that is often used that you know when we sit on a giant wheel you know that merry go round the moment i sit on the merry go round it is certain that i will rise and it is certain that i will fall but what i do is that when i am rising i am delighted i am happy and i say oh wow see 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 i'm going up look at the view look at the view and the moment the fall comes i start crying are 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 ab kya ho raha hai ab kya ho raha hai main to upar ja raha tha main to upar ja raha tha so this thing that the moment you sit on the giant wheel that is the moment that your fall is decided and that's the cyclical nature of you know how things work some things good something bad and all happiness comes with pain and all pain has some delight in it it leads to that and it might sound strange but if we reflect on our lives we see that it is quite true so once we start realizing i mean it really helped me that when we start realizing the mechanical nature of things you know we stop reacting so much we stop taking things personally we realize ki acha aise hi to hota hai are aise hi to hota hai to har cheez mein i'm not just crying or feeling so ecstatic ki pata nahi kya ho gaya so that equanimity that starts coming in naturally when i'm more honest when i'm more mindful when i'm more factual about the way things are happening around me I'll just finish this, and of course, anything. Uh, anybody has any questions before I go on? Please do let me know. So, Josna Ji, just to give you a brief introduction, uh, we have just started chapter one of this compilation called "Looking from Within." So, the chapter is looking at life and circumstances, and the first part was power of attitude. which said that you know there is nothing as such in life good or bad it's our attitude which makes or break things and now we are on the second section the determining power is within so we are just reading the first paragraph from the determining power is within okay so i will just finish this and then we can take up more things on this so it said to face them with equanimity if one cannot manage a cheerful persistence against them of confidence and resolute will diminishes you know re resolute will diminishes on the contrary their importance and effect and in the end do not at once gets rid of the persistence and recurrence so if something is happening to me if i don't lash out if i don't cry out if i'm able to become a little bit more equanimous towards it or if i have the strength to be cheerful then its effect on me will also diminish and it will stop coming to me you know it's a law of nature right like when somebody is like say if we have we are two siblings or if there are two children and if one ch child is bothering the other child what do we tell them that stop reacting right and then the other child will stop troubling you so this is how i've seen that even the life circumstances the challenges it happen that when we stop reacting suddenly things change suddenly it's like a miracle almost that it's like oh the problem is gone really but it has to be a genuine non reaction it cannot be that i'm pretending to react not react or andar se mujhe bahut kuch ho raha hai when we actually we see this in diseases we see this in challenges we see this in relationships that if we truly accept your you know your will teri marzi we see that change
Yoshnadi, I think you might want to add something to this, having lived it no, so recently. I, I agree with you. You actually, if you don't react, or rather you just walk away from it, is a simpler way I would put it. You just move away. And tell yourself, uh, no, this need this action need not be in your life. And then automatically, it's reactivity and slapping goes down. Definitely. And so many events come, and each time they try to poke at you. But if you re equanimous, it does happen. It's very important for us to be equanimous. We have to try to keep one level of uh, calm in us and uh, in the small things, in the big things, in the bigger things, uh, as, uh, you, as you stay calm and walk away from them, I mean internally walk away from them, automatically they shed off like clothes and leave you. They actually leave you however uh, serious they may be. Especially when, um, you know, when something to do with health or uh, the body or something serious hits you, the first, um, the first uh, reaction is to react and get emotional and, no, if you're just calm, sit down and tell yourself, I need not do this, walk away or just stay calm and slowly move away, it works. It does. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, especially when it's a lived experience, it's, you know, somehow it's validity, it's authenticity, it comes out, right? That how it, and it's beyond the mind, right? The mind gets boggled by these things that, how can if I stop paying attention or reacting, how will it go away? That makes no sense. And yet, if we experiment, if we see, because we like to experiment, you will we see that it is the truth of how things work. That thing has power in itself. I give it power. And if I am giving it power, I can take the power away too. Jagat, did you unmute? I don't. I am sorry if you were sharing something. I didn't realize. No, I accidentally left it unmuted. Okay. Sorry. Oh. It would reduce and its importance would lessen. And though not at once, because everything takes time, we get rid of their persistence and recurrence. It is therefore a principle in yoga to recognize the determining power of what is within us. For that is the deeper truth to set that right and establish the inward strength as against the power of outer circumstances. You know, like Sri Aurobindo's yoga is called integral yoga. So whatever we are reading, it falls under that. So he is saying that it is therefore a principle in yoga to recognize the determining power of what is within us. You know, we have so much strength. We have so much power. And yet we live life like beggars. Like I'm totally depending on circumstances. Wherever life throws me, I go. But that's not true. So it's saying, he's saying that this power within us is the deeper truth to set that right and establish the inward strength as against the power of outer circumstances. So something is kind of throwing something from outside. I have an inverse strength. I use it. I set it right, you know, against it. And the strength is there, he's assuring us, even in the weakest. But one has to find it, 
to unveil it and to keep it in front throughout the journey and the battle. You know how one keeps the shield in front, right? When one is, say, fighting, we have seen this in movies and all. And this is our shield, our power. But again, I, I might have shared this before, but it's like, you know, Hanuman, that Hanuman, when he reached, they were reached at the end of the Indian boundary and they had to, then they had gone to see if Sita was in Lanka. He didn't know. He said, I have never flown that far, right? And everybody reminded him, you know, in the Ramayan, we saw, I don't know if we all saw it, you know, Ramanan Sagar Ramayan. There was a beautiful song, Hanuman, tum kar sakte ho, tum mein hai wo shakti. But wo shakti hum sab mein hai. We have just forgotten and we just have to be reminded. And then we have to practice, right? Like muscles get built in gymming. We build those internal muscles and we are much, much, much stronger. Sri Aurobindo says that even in the weakest, that power is there to face all circumstances with equanimity. And once we have recognized that strength, so, you know, hold on to it, not let it go and keep it throughout the journey. So, I think I'll stop here and if there's anything, I hope there is. Any concerns, any reflections, something from personal experiences, please do share before we... Uh, Ma'am, can you uh, read one sentence one more time? Uh, can you sc scroll down a little bit if possible? Yes. Yeah. You know, one thing I didn't understand, it says to face them with equanimity if one cannot manage a cheerful persistence against them of confident and resolute will diminishes. Uh, I didn't understand that sentence actually. Yeah, there's, I think there's some issue with the sentence correction or maybe we are not able okay. to read it properly. But what it means is that when we face something with equanimity, you know, if you leave the middle thing, it diminishes, right? Like the effect of that thing, the power of that thing diminishes. And here it's saying in the central one that ideal would be that you remain cheerful. You know how, again... I am remembering, you know, Ramayan, Mahabharata and all. When the tear is, you know, the arrow is thrown. You know, the person is just laughing, right? Because they know it cannot do anything against. You know, they are too powerful for that arrow, for example. So just that if we are equanimous, if we cannot maintain a cheerful persistence, but if we can at least be neutral to it, then it diminishes in and in, instead of increasing their importance goes down and slowly the persistence and recurrence stops before it gets less and less yeah okay thank you ma So, if nothing is, I will move forward. And if there's anything I know, you'll unmute and share. So, let's take the next passage. And that would be the last thing we do. Today. Let's see if we can finish it. And if anybody is willing, they can please unmute and read the whole passage. It's a small one. In the play of the cosmic forces, the will in the cosmos as one might say, does not always work apparently in favor of a smooth and direct line for work or sadhana. It often brings in what seems to be upheavals, sudden turns which break or deflect the line, opposing or upsetting circumstances 
or perplexing departures from what had been temporarily settled or established. The one thing is to pre preserve equanimity and make an opportunity and means of progress out of all that happens in the course of a life and the sadhana. There is a higher secret will transcendent behind the play and will of the cosmic forces, a play which is always a mixture of things favorable and things adverse. And it is that will which one must wait upon and have faith in. But you must not expect to be able to always understand its working. The mind wants this or that to be done, the line once taken to be maintained, but what the mind wants is not at all always what is intended in a larger purpose. One has to follow indeed a fixed central aim in the sadhana and not deviate from it, but not to build on outward circumstances, conditions, etc., as if they were fundamental things. Sri Aurobindo. Yes, just reminding us that this is not a book as such, this is a compilation. So there would be repetitions and good that they are repetitions because we need those repetitions. So yeah. Ritu, would you like to add something? Yeah, it is all quite beautiful, you know, reading this and reminding yourself again. But in my case, I mean, I do react. I do get upset. And although even when I'm getting upset in my mind, I tell myself that, look, there is no point in reacting. There's no point in getting upset. But then something in me just puts that thought behind. It's as if a storm has taken over and I have no control. I am somewhere in me, there is a voice which is telling me, empty your cup, this is all useless, these are all weeds, stop it, don't let the negative thoughts come. <laughs> but then when they come, they get so powerful that I again get carried away. So that's the problem. I mean, when I'm in, in the normal situation, I I understand all this. But when I'm in a situation where I need to work on them, I need to exhibit whatever I'm reading and whatever I'm trying to imbibe, then I kind of, you know, fail. Yes, you know, if, if you have, you, there's a small child and there's a bully that troubles him and there's nothing else you can do by chance in that situation. All you have to, all you can do is tell the child to stand up against the bully. And you, you know, you have put them in say a boxing class, you put them in martial arts and every day the child comes and says, but the bully, you know, again, he was able to beat me again. He was, what would you tell him? Yeah, I would again tell him to try again. Keep standing. One day you will. Mm -hmm. Believe in yourself. Keep developing the muscles, right? But meanwhile, while you're not getting attacked, because the attack may be of 10 minutes, right? But he has so many other hours to practice, right? To make oneself stronger and stronger. So just yeah. that, you know, these hostile forces, this thing that, you know, it's like, if I ask you, who are you? You would say, I am this body, right? And the body has the mind, the body has this physical, the feelings. So, you know, the masters and mystics that say that we should have so much control over body. They say that we can control our thoughts. We can control our feelings. The thought is coming and you're like, shh. And it goes. A feeling is coming. And you're like, not right now. And it goes. 
So this is the mastery that I am capable of. Right? I know this now, that this is my capability. This is my possibility. This is my certainty. It just the time might vary. So first, I could not even see how these things overtake me, how anger overtake me, how emotions overtake me. But now I can see and maybe sometimes I might be able to react less or not react. And yet, if I see that I'm not be able to control, that means I need to work more on mastering my mind and being stronger, just like that small child has to stand up to the bully, I have to stand up to these attacks that I get. It's The bully is a bully because nobody has stood up to him, right? If at the beginning we would have stood up to the bully or if we had the potential and the strength that the bully has, we would not be in this situation, right? We were always scared. We were always just following the dictates. So now if we want to stop doing what we have been doing for years and years or maybe lifetimes, a lot of muscle will have to be developed that I don't want to go that way. And I think a lot of times we have to reach a point of absolute disgust with ourselves, I feel. Ye bhi, phir, abhi bhi, abhi bhi, abhi bhi to, you know, self-abnegation ho jata, self-abandonment ho jata, ki mere se, ab ye, jo kuch bhi ho, ye I can't do. So that also gives us the strength. Yeah, but, but you know, somehow when the person who's getting bullied, they try to develop the muscle and the power and then again they fail, then, then it difficult for them to kind of believe in themselves again. It feels that I'm not probably, you know, good enough for all this. So I know when we look at it from a distance, it feels that yes, keep trying, it'll happen. But when you're in the midst of thing and then you again react the same way and then again the same thought process follows and then you get angry, you lose your temper, you feel bad. I mean, you get blown away by the things which are happening then it later on it feels like shit I again got into the same mess again so then it becomes a little discouraging that hey, I'm good for I'm not good enough for all this so that happens I think like you yourself said that if you look at it from a distance right you would always tell the child not to give up right and you would know that there would come a day when the bully would not be able to trouble them, right? Can you say that with confidence that if the child is sincere enough and has committed fully, it's not possible that that problem would not be solved. At least that's what we would like to believe. So let's stop being so close to ourselves. Let's stop taking things as just I, 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 having faith. And you know, in this thing, I was thinking that, you know, in exams, what is the passing percentage? It's 30%, 40%, right? 32% in India, I think, or at usually 40% in our schools, na? So, in case, mein, how much time of my day am I spending developing my muscle? Right? Like 40% would be how many hours or 24 hours, you tell me? 10.6. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, am I even spending one complete hour in mastering myself, in sitting with myself, in developing that muscle, right? Like, I am I? So, just mm -hmm. that, that it's if I have to pass for a petty exam, I spend 18 hours a day, 16 hours a day. You have done CA. I saw how much you studied, right? So, and for this, again, the examinations in my life, the situations I so badly want to overcome, 
how much time am i spending parallelly in addition to wishing and aspiring how much practice am i doing there are so many practices right that we know about that help us in mastering so this just means that if i really want it i will have to put it in practice hai na hame ka you know there is this misconception and it takes a long time to understand this there's something in me which feels that if i've heard something or if i've read something it will just come to my life it will just happen no i get it acha aise baithna hai aise meditate karna hai acha thoughts ko aise control karna hai ye lo dekho mujhe sab samajh aa gaya and when i sit for 2 minutes and i see 50 random things come up we realize it you know oh god this is a different ball game so practice listening is different hearing is different reading is different practicing in our everyday life is very different and when it comes down to practice only then does the transformation happen if i am sincere if i have had enough of nonsense i have to stand up against myself and start training myself to stand up again and this is why the fight is very tough because it is against myself a part of me is fighting another part ah uh, please uh, i don't know i'm talking and talking any reflections any things that we we i think that i'm trying and i'm um putting my everything but actually the sincerity which should be there is not there so need to build up the muscles more and that only you can tell right because we know the best hai na so once we see that either i can stop saying that i want it want it want it if i see i'm not putting effort in it or only i can tell mm-hmm. or i can now say that acha ये करना था ये तो मुझे रियलाइज ही नहीं हुआ राइट सुनने से तो होगा नहीं सो देन आई कैन स्टार्ट पुटिंग मोर एफर्ट एंड रिमेम्बरिंग दैट द पासिंग परसेंटेज इज 40 परसेंट सो लेट मी बिगेन विद मे बी फाइव परसेंट राइट सो थैंक यू फॉर दैट क्वेश्चन अगेन एवरीबडी स्टोरी Yes, Vasu. So you don't have to raise your hand any time. Just unmute and please, yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm not speaking over the other person. Yeah. Um. So all that we discussed today, I mean, everything really speaks to me, and um, I think of the bully as. I think it's important because the bullies will keep coming in life, and. i think in a weird sense it's important to have those bullies because if we don't have those bullies we don't get an opportunity to flex our muscles um so we have to go through that right and it's a practice like you mentioned that yes we've never really arrived but it's a process so we have to keep doing it and doing it like we say that practice makes perfect so maybe the bully can just be in different guys different circumstances and different situations but then as we gear up so ourselves and we are training our muscles so to say then we can better face them next time round um that's one thing uh, i just written a few things like uh, you know for me this is pretty much been an experiment i've been doing all this what um we just read in the book so i can speak to how much uh truth and i think weight is in all almost every sentence so i don't really know what single sentence to pick up and really highlight it um you know i think it's a, it is a challenge at least personally i feel it's a challenge to put that into practice that it's so easy to take in all the good that happens to us and you want that good to always keep lasting but then the moment the challenges come and we're like why me and you know you don't want to face that uh but i was just trying to think that i wish life had a manual etc cetera, etc cetera. and then one day when i was just thinking and i do this introspection 
was just thinking, I said, actually, we just complicate life so much because life is actually very simple. Um, you know, it's uh, if you just think about it, that nothing is linear and nothing is a constant except change, then it's just a little less challenging to embrace it in its fullness. So you have the positive, you have the negative, or I wouldn't say negative really, I'd say lessons or I'd say challenges, which help you to grow. Uh, I think my, personally, my maximum growth has been through my challenges. So I, it's difficult, but I would say thank you to people who helped me to grow and who threw those challenges at me, because if it was, if it wasn't for those situations or those people, then I really wouldn't be where I am today. So, so I just loved, I just absolutely loved whatever was read today. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Vasil, for sharing. Taru, I think somewhere uh, Mother has said that uh, if a situation arises, which uh, arises very often, many times in a day, that goes against your set pattern or your expectations, and um, uh, or it it begins to turn unpleasant you know it it's not what you want and it's not something you can face at that time she says develop your equanimity but if you're not ready if you're not prepared which you know you are not prepared move away especially with people like you were talking about bullies and you know, people who can disturb you or imbalance you or a situation that can do it. She says, walk away and see where you can find a path, a, a stage of calm. And try not to, um, you know, interact with those particular uh, forces or people. Now, in when we are in family life and we we cannot do that we cannot walk away so it is always where you you get equanimous and the first step that one practices is do not react if you don't react 50% of those hidden forces that knock on your door they they leave the other 50% which you have to deal with comes with a little bit of time and training yourself and hammering to yourself repeatedly that no, but I, I cannot be a part of this. I am I I it is not it is not good for me or my progress in the path I want. I cannot be a part of it. I must not be a part of it. And must, there within you, you feel ripped because there is one part which is very strong and vital to pull you to say, no, no, go for it. There's so much pleasure in it. And there's a kind of a fun in an argument. But then there is one tiny whiny part that says, no, just, just move away and try this. And after a few, I think tens, hundreds of tries, you realize that the that path of equanimity and keeping away, going away from the situation and then thinking, standing back and watching does help. That I have experienced it and I have been training my mind. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a struggle. But then at some stage it comes that, okay, you know, it, it is worth it to be a little away from it. Whether it's a bully, whether it's uh, a situation, whether it's a health problem, whether it's a disaster, stand back, be calm, and then try to be away. It works. Mother has mentioned somewhere, I will try and search it. It's there, I think, in Sunlit Path also. I have a feeling. 
Actually, I was just looking through that because I also remember reading a passage on it which said that, you know, even if you fall down 100,000 times, just, you know, get up, brush your pants, look up, smile and begin again. Because it's, what should I search for, Yosna ji? What word? Oh, you are on mute. You are on mute. Yosna ji, you are on mute. I will search it out. Maybe you look for a walk away. Yeah. Or you look at situation or something. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, I think we'll maybe share it on the group. I'll try to find it. Um, yeah, and I'll share that Sunday part passage as well that we have to keep doing. But, you know, because most of these bullies that I was talking about are, are internal bullies, right? That yes. I'm not one, I'm many. So in that case, walking away at times is not an option. But, yeah, they have, it's symbolic and... and Oh, uh, like I could talk for myself. I um I, I faced an illness and I'm still facing, which doesn't give me any alarm and it comes. Now there are two ways I could react: is panic or, you know, remain calm and try to not let it trigger further. And to stop it from triggering further or from coming. The only thing I found was a kind of an equanimity and a control that, no, I can't let this happen. I've got to remain calm. And in all that crisis and churning, and uh, I still, I used to tell myself, I failed. I failed one and a half years of trying to do it. But then slowly, it it will come. It comes that uh, within yourself. That no, I have to not give it power. I cannot give it power, so I will not give it power. And then it troubles you, but then you stick to that. And uh, then at the end of it, you see little streaks of winning when you walked away from it. Small, little, very, very little. But then after that, then a kind of a calm sets in. I don't know how to explain it in words. But mother clearly says that um, you just move away from that situation. You know, sometimes I've also seen that, although I don't want to say it because that would want us not to make effort, Let's say if I'm say playing guitar and there's something I'm not getting, if I don't try it for a week and I try it after maybe a week or 10 days, suddenly I'm able to do it, right? Like sometimes time just helps us in, I don't know, bridging a gap or doing something. So I think that distance, sometimes we are trying too hard, right? And when we step back, sometimes it just helps us in understanding that the situation is not that big, right? I am just saying mostly based on a Rai Ka Pahar. We keep playing Rai Ka Pahar and it doesn't have to be that bad. It's not that hard. And then you start laughing at the same thing that was probably giving you, I don't know, causing tears or blood. Yeah. Yeah, any last comments before we end for the day? I like to call it sometimes the pregnant pause. Not even a pause, but a pregnant pause. So that you can really sit with it for some time. And in my experience, I've noticed that many times when I sit and I just let it be without doing like you mentioned about the guitar. 
everything pretty much falls into place. And sometimes you don't need to do anything about it. It just dissolves by itself. So it's good at times to just let it be and not attend to it. So that can help as well. Um, Ma'am, I have one question. So when you were talking about the bully, right? So to me, a bully can be, like you said, can be internal, can be external, can be my insecurity. For someone, it can be jealousy. Bully comes in different shapes and forms. So, you know, now I'm, I'm trying to put it in a correct way. So now I'm trying to face my bully every single day. And, you know, day one, he beats me down. Day two, he beats me down. Day three, he beats me down. Every day I come home, I, I, I practice more and I'm still getting beaten. So what I have observed is in my head, there are two rooms. One is a room where I live with my bully. And one is a room where I live by myself. So Every day I'm coming home and I am only staying in the room where my bully stays. And I'm looking at my bully every day, not looking at myself. Even when I'm training, I'm looking at my bully. Oh, he's on the hundredth step. I'm I'm not even, I, I don't even know where I am. Maybe I'm on the 99th step, but I am still insecure because I'm only looking at the bully. I'm not looking at myself every day. Because, the, and that is only fueling my insecurity because... You know, at one point, maybe I'm at the 99th step and I lose hope and then I'm done. And then I'm nowhere. So the question is, um, how should I come out of the room where my bully is and go into my own room and just focus on myself and see that, okay, you know what? Yesterday I was on step one. My bully is on step 100. That's fine. But today I'm on step three. So I'm better than yesterday. Tomorrow, I'll be on step seven. And when I am practicing and when I'm in my room, the bully doesn't even come anywhere close to my mind or in my thoughts. So how do I totally shield the thought of my bully when I'm training, after I'm training, and only see myself improving? Because I'm pretty sure that after, you know, with practice, the muscles improve. It's just that I need to recognize it, that my muscles are improving and not look at my bully and just keep on comparing. So how do I do it? Like, how do I go into my own room and just look at myself? Yes, anybody would want to reflect on that? Yeah, Daru, first of all, I would say to myself that don't trust your thoughts because the mind is a very ticklish kind of thing. It always tricks us in from what you call from dark zone. Okay. So first of all, I won't trust I won't trust my thoughts and I would have stopped comparing because this and that comparisons are odious. And maybe I would take a break from all this thing. Maybe I would go into a retreat or I would read some book uh, or I would try my hand at something different. And then after a renewed vigor of say a week or two, I would attempt at it again. Yes, thank you, Sham. So this is almost in line with what Josna Ji was talking about, walking away, right? At times, walking away. Because when I walked away, then I am just with myself. Yeah, we'll reflect more on it. Yes, Vasuki. Uh, I think uh, Jagan pretty much answered his dilemma by talking about the two rooms because he talked about the other room. So we know that that exists, right? So you're not able to thrive or you ha go into comparison because you're in a room with the bully. So you know that if you step out, it's almost like a sense of detachment, which means that you're not running away from the problem. It's just that you are stepping away 
and being in that sphere where you can look at it objectively and then you can look at your own progress and look how far you've come as opposed to being in that room where there would be maybe by default already a comparison. So you pretty much answered that there are two rooms. So there's this choice to go to the other room. It's just the thing of that, you know, um, sometimes a change in place, not literally, but just even your mind, like just being in a different space can help to just get those pieces together and just look at things with better clarity. That's what I would I would think. Thank you. I don't know, there was this poem, I don't know, by Khalil Gibran, and that there was this thing about different floors, right? Say on the ground floor, there is total chaos, there is a lot of trauma, a lot of people, a lot of noise making. Yosnaji, would you like to uh, talk about that? I think you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Abolo, abolo. Yeah, so... It's Khalil Gibran. Yeah, it's Khalil Gibran, na? yeah. So he said, you know, it's like when we are trying to solve our problems or trying to get to the root of things or trying to kind of approach each and every bully and trying to build a muscle towards it. It's very exhausting. Each and every emotion, each and every thought, I say, what is the root? Where did it come from? Why did it come from? How much will we do it? You know, there are people who offer past life regressions and we do that. But how many lives have we had and how many past life regressions will we do? How many traumas will we overcome? He talks about changing the floor. Like you were talking about room. It was a beautiful example how Vasu also pointed out that because I cannot clean, it's not possible for me to make it all clean and go and talk to each and everyone that Tum kharabo, I am not scared of you. Tum aise ho. My lifetimes would go and I would not finish with all the issues that I am carrying. But I can change the floor. I can say that, ha, jisne kiya, you know, just I, I can be the one who stays on the ground floor, but I also have the choice to go on the top floor and say, Iske sab kuch, you know, I've just changed the floor. Now it's not there for me. Clean slate. Clean slate. Because a lot of times, you know, like they say that our eyelashes are so close to our eyes that we can't see it. We have to distance ourselves. We have to distance from that I who says, Isne me sar ye karo, usne me sar ye karo, ye mujhe bully karo, or me. Lot of times we do see that if a child is having too much issues, we change the school, right? First we try, we speak to the principal, we speak here and there, we give it a lot of effort. And yet, if something is continued, we think, chalo bhaiya, dusra, dusra school me dal do, maybe it would help because it's not good. It, it would be, it will make us crazy if we keep at it, right? But you know, all these calculations is exhausting. So yes, you choose to go to the room where the bully stays because there's a thrill there, right? Even if you are the victim there, there's a thrill in being the victim. Kuch to action ho rahi hai na? Life boring ya monotonous to nahi hai. But agar ab us action se, us thrill se, I don't enjoy that anymore. I can stop entering that room where it happened. So, ma'am, so I still want to fight the bully in, in the room. It's just that when I'm training or, you know, when I'm training, when I'm in my own element, I don't want to think about the bully. And if I'm in the same room as the bully, where the bully is, then I'm only looking at him. I, when I'm training, it's like being my own competition. Like when I'm training, I want to stay in a different room. When I'm, when I'm, I know when I'm ready, I want to go face the bully, if get beaten up, if get beaten up, then again, go back into my room and look at myself and not look at the, what the bully did to me. 
so i'm always motivated yeah again like you said that you are your own competition you can forget about the bully that would be the walking away you just develop your muscles keep developing them and if the bully comes again why should we go to the bully right but if the bully comes again if we face them then we can see who's stronger at that time and how much more strength do we need because you must look at the one in you who says i want to defeat him maybe there's nothing to defeat maybe the purpose of the bully how vasu was sharing is just to build up my muscles and when i look there okay now i'm fully built up i'll see are the bully was an illusion wahan tak kuch tha hi nahi i was just imagining things so not to take everything so seriously taking things a bit lightly you know shri aurobindo and so many other masters and mystics speak so much so highly about sense of humor right that uske bina hoga nahi so sometimes you have to laugh at ourselves ki are isko main bully samajh raha tha right or how seriously was i taking it so taking things a bit lightly working on yourself that is something that we must and can do and if the situations come wo dikha denge ki fir kis mein kitna hai dam and then if need be i'll practice more i'll share Number that khalil kibran thing and we'll reflect on it further but yes please what were you saying but no but you know um, sometimes i don't want to take it easy on the bully sometimes yeah, i'm determined is saying that So the one who's saying that is he not choosing war over peace, right? You have to prove something to the world or to the bully, right? Who's watching? Who are you proving anything to? Nobody's interested, But right? Is it always about war? Like bully doesn't necessarily need to be a war, right? It, let's say you give a example what you are struggling with if you could give share that with us i think it would be more right about we'll be able to that's better so, understand yeah, let's say insecurity is a bully mm -hmm. you know insecurity is such a bully that um i know how much it is hiding my potential like how badly it is hiding my potential and there were times where i kind of took things for like i i took it light heartedly but it didn't work out for me because you know the, at one point i i i you know i look at myself and i'm looking at all the years that have passed and i see that okay kitne saal aise hi karega kitne saal like how long how long because even you know at one point even hanuman ji was uh, you know had to be motivated by jambon there is no jambon in my life i have to be my own jambon so a uh, who like how will i get motivated because you know at, if jambon was like like okay you know we'll just take it light then hanuman ji wouldn't fly to sri lanka i want to fly to that lanka so uh, how like you know i know that i need to go out of the room to focus on myself and to be calm and to be happy every day to be motivated but what is what is that thing that i need to do like should i practice mind control or should i um that is what i am confused ajay gan isme to one has to go and look at what the insecurity is saying to me right we can talk about it one to one because if something is standing very strongly at times one has to face it ki ha kya chahiye right what do you want from me and what are the roots if something is kind of struggling but say if you know what the bully does the bully says you i will beat you or you know you are nobody or you can be nobody for example so how do i beat that bully i when i become someone when the insecurity doesn't make me insecure anymore that is me beating insecurity right i don't have to stand and say oh i beat you i will beat you or i have right like i am winning my win in itself happens when it doesn't affect me anymore yeah so going to the root of it 
what is the insecurity saying why is it there and sometimes or a lot of time things just get released that i was holding on to the false to the illusionary it was not even needed in the first place a lot of time childhood trauma childhood challenges happen and at that tender age we don't know how to deal with it how to take it where to put it so those stick but when we look at it we realize usme it's not much power right it's very illusionary and it just goes i'll talk to you about this yeah we Yeah, Vasu, you wanted to share something? No. no, it's okay. No, if there's something, do share and then we land. I just wanted to say that if it was your friend, let's say, and this is for you, Jagan, if it was your best friend in your spot, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here, but if this was your best friend, I, it's your choice if you want to share it here or you just want to reflect on it or write about what would you say to your best friend if your best friend was going through this circumstance because sometimes and where i'm coming from is that you're very good with being very kind to other people but sometimes we beat ourselves a lot uh when we face challenges so if you would if you could think that if my friend was going through this what would i say to him so sometimes your answer can come in that and also it could like how uh, you know taruna said about like going to the root of your insecurity like what is it like if it helps you to write it down whichever way helps you sometimes some people are good with like visualizing or writing down pretty much putting pen to paper as to what are my insecurities and where is it coming is this something that someone has told me or is this that i myself think about it so sometimes it could be something that just distorted maybe somebody said that and if that tape has been going on playing we start believing what someone says to us about those insecurities maybe we are confident but someone keeps hammering it over a period of time externally we might start believing it i'm not saying i, I don't know what's the story but i'm just saying like i'm just throwing some things out there so that it can just help to you know like just look at it and sort of hash it and again just to go into that other room and that space you know not live in that room with the bully and try to think i don't know how effective that's going to be but if you can step away in a space like even you know like sometimes like at least for me personally if i have to make decisions i need to step away to a place or a space where i can think clearly so maybe that might help that's what i just want to share thank you thank you thank you vasuji a lot of reflections lot of things to i don't know consider and question yeah taru that uh, writing of letter thing really helps okay so i have tried it with myself and it is really helpful okay Jagan has got a lot of homework to do for the next session. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Joshna ji, what were you? Saying? Is living within by Dr. Dalal? Yes, it's a compilation by Dr. Dalal. It's the same. Okay. Mm. That was one of the last ones that he. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Ritu, you are on mute if you are saying something. Yeah. Okay. So, what letter, Sham? Uh, help. Uh, uh, how do I put it? Well, right from very childhood days only, I had this habit of writing letter to my cousins, to sisters, to father, to everybody. Okay. So once I thought that, why don't I write a letter to myself? So I started penning down something and something, and it came to me that. it did open many closed doors and i was very elated after that letter was finished and later on when i read it after say a span of two days i felt more elated and i read, and i read this in a self help book that if you write letters to yourself you do feel 
lighter and all that. So it was a formal letter or it was a very... Um, um, informal kind of. Candid letter. <laughs> yeah, candid only, informal and candid. Nice. And I went to a workshop where they told that you should write letter to the dead people, you know, like if someone of the you know, family who died, write a letter to her and it will feel good, it will feel lighter and all that. So I just tried to imbibe in my own life and it did really help. There is a very uh, there is a very nice book Notes to Myself by Huge Pretha where he sits at the kitchen table and he writes uh, little little you know four liners five liners while his wife is in the kitchen cooking or doing something you know, he tried very hard to become a publisher, uh, to, to publish a book, to become an author. He wrote many books, but they were never uh, published. But when he took this little anecdote, which he used to, these little anecdotes, which he used to write to himself, funny anecdotes or something witty about himself, and uh, which was so elating to him, so he would keep writing them, uh, you know, more and more and had a whole uh, file of them. That got published, and uh, it it is uh, it is very nice to read, very light, but um, it sort of puts back a zing in your life. You must uh, see that little thing. It will give you an idea also about writing. What is that Notes book name, ma'am? Can I please? Notes to myself. Yes, by Huge Pretha. Very interesting, very fun. Nothing to do with spirituality, but um, it kind of gives you a spark to go on for the next day because you actually laugh it off. Small things. It's a very small book. You know, I've often seen it at the checkout counters. You know how they have those things where you're checking out so that you can pick up something just easy. So it's most sort of times there are copies of it there. It's a lovely little thing. And uh, writing is only, I think, on one page. Yeah. But, but I love that book. It's a very, very nice. Yeah. Okay, so it's almost 90 minutes. So we'll let him <laughs> go but it feels like hardly I don't know it didn't it didn't feel that long at least to me so just before we disperse just taking a few moments of gratefulness this blessing to have a sangha a company so that we can explore these horizons these different territories which often appear difficult to us and we try to approach them alone. And so much joy and so much strength the company gives. So expressing a lot of gratitude for that. Thanking Grace. Thanking the Divine Mother Sri Aurobindo for these beautiful words. And like we distribute prasad to everybody, we say jitne zada, you know, so again, sharing the merit, whatever we have accumulated through the sharings, reflections, the words with everybody, because not everybody is reading these words, but we are the fortunate ones who have the ability, even if just for a session, to come in contact with something which is bigger than the little me. Well, thank you.